All right, good evening to everybody. Uh, Open your Bibles, please, and turn to Psalm 36, the 36th Psalm. That will be the first one that we have a chance to stop and read. We're going to be kind of overviewing a lot of Psalms tonight. Brian, uh, on Sunday, introduced the uh, book of Psalms, even though we've already dealt with a lot of the Psalms when we looked at the life of David, but he kind of uh, showed us how everything in the book is arranged, and he got into a couple of the, the uh, categories of the Psalms, and so tonight we're going to look at uh, this category, I guess you could call it, not really a category, but sort of, uh, Psalms about the righteous and the wicked, uh, but before we jump into that, I've asked Phil if he would lead us in a word of prayer. Bow your heads. Father in heaven, we bow before you humbly. And we are so happy to be here in your presence. We thank you for your word that we're going to open tonight. And ask you to be with us, be with the teachers. Be with us, Father. Open the hearts and minds to receive the word as we intend for the benefit that goes along with it as well. We thank you for the blessing of Christ. In Jesus' name. Amen. So, we want to first look at some psalms that are all about the wickedness of men uh, that really hone in and focus as their primary purpose talking about the wickedness of men. And the first two are uh, Psalm 14 and Psalm 53. And we're not going to turn and read those. I've actually already covered Psalm 14, which... Psalm 53 is identical pretty much to earlier when we did study the life of David. Um, both of these psalms survey humanity and conclude that all mankind is wicked. Does anybody remember how those two psalms begin? The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. And it goes on to talk about there is none righteous, not even one. And seems like Paul quoted from that. Does anybody remember where Paul quoted that? Romans 3. It's in Romans 3. And that's where he's making the point uh, that both Jews and Gentiles are all under sin. We're all under sin. And then, of course, what does Romans 3.23 say? All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now, most times when I hear that verse quoted, it's misquoted. And here's how most people say it. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That's not what the verse says. It says for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We have sinned and we continue to sin. We continue to fall short. And the point is we, we constantly need the grace of God. And so Paul uses those two uh, psalms, or one of them, I'm not sure which one he was quoting from, but maybe both of them, because since they're so similar, to really emphasize that point, that we're all under sin. It's a universal problem. Two other psalms that fit in this category of the wickedness of men are Psalm 36 and Psalm 52. So Psalm 36, we're going to read a little from there. I want to read the first four verses. Transgression speaks to the ungodly within his heart. There is no fear of God before his eyes, for it flatters him in his own eyes concerning the discovery of his iniquity and the hatred of it. The words of his mouth are wickedness and deceit. He has ceased to be wise and to do good. He plans wickedness upon his bed. He sets himself on a path that is not good. He does not despise evil. As the psalm continues, the righteousness of God is contrasted with the wickedness of man. But just look at how thoroughly wicked this, this description is of, of man who turns away from God. He ponders and plans wickedness on his bed. You know, contrast that with many of the Psalms that talk about what, should, what does the righteous person do while he's in bed. He meditates on God and on His law and on His Word. So this is a person who, when he's not sinning, he's plotting how he will sin. Thoroughly, thoroughly wicked. He's even impressed with his own wickedness, as verse 2 talks about. 
Psalm 52 is another psalm here that describes the wicked. And in that psalm, there's a special emphasis on the deceitful tongue. David there says, Your tongue devises destruction like a sharp razor, O worker of deceit. Sins of the tongue are perhaps the most prominent and most common feature of the wicked. If it's not the most common feature, it's one of the most common features in the book of Psalms of the wicked is this deceitful tongue. You just see that over and over. And and the righteous, by contrast, are so often described as those whose tongues are not full of deceit. So that was a a really big deal to to David who wrote wrote so many of, of the Psalms. Sometimes we just overlook just how prominent sins of the tongue are. We just don't put the effort forth at concentrating on overcoming those. And uh, we forget what James told us. What did James tell us about the tongue? It's, it, no, man can, no, no man can tame it. it. It's a fire. The very world of iniquity, all of that. So we certainly see that emphasis in, in the Psalms of these sins of the tongue. So those are four very specific psalms about the wickedness of men. Anybody have any questions or you want to make any comments on those, any of those four psalms or any of the points I made? Joe? The one that, you, the one that kind of stands out is where you're talking about in bed. You know, like when you wake up, it's like he's, as soon as he wakes up, he's thinking about iniquity. Yeah. I guess before he goes to bed, as opposed to maybe praying or meditating, he, his day, he's got yeah. to with, yeah. And that's just what, when, you know, when you think about it, you're either going to do the right thing or the wrong thing. You know. Right. And don't we have to be so careful? I mean, sin, sin doesn't just come out of nowhere. It, it starts in our heart, as, as Jesus said. And it starts in your mind. And we need to be using our mind uh, and using those quiet moments to, to plan on improving ourselves and to drawing closer to God and things like that, instead of, well, what can I, what can I do today that's evil? But sir? It is kind of interesting that uh, the bed is, is used there because there's basically four options for when you go to bed from Scripture, right? As you were saying, prayer, meditation, taking quiet and assessing yourself and getting prepared for tomorrow, or the wickedness, devising your wicked plans. I think it's in Proverbs it says that uh, many people... Uh, spend back and forth in their bed, and they take their bed for worry. They spend their time in worry in bed. And then, of course, you, the fourth option is to do nothing, right? To think about nothing, just to, just totally oblivious to... Watch TV. Exactly, exactly. But um, it is an interesting uh, yeah. use. Yeah, in those, in those quiet moments, you know, um, the importance of focusing on good things. Well, let's move forward, talk about the character of the righteous, now, there are many psalms here. There are nine that I have listed here that describe the character of, of the righteous. Let's look, for example, at Psalm 15. Notice I'm not saying Psalms 15, because the book of Psalms is not made up of chapters, but individual psalms. So Psalm 15. O Lord, who may abide in your tent? Who may dwell on your holy hill? He who walks with integrity, and works righteousness, and speaks truth in his heart. That's an interesting phrase. He does not slander with his tongue, nor does evil to his neighbor, nor takes up a reproach against his friend, and whose eyes a reprobate is despised, but who honors those who fear the Lord. He swears to his own herd and does not change. He does not put out his money at interest, nor does he take a bribe against the innocent, he who does these things will never be shaken. This, this individual that's described here is someone that's not interested in what he can gain in every situation. He's interested in doing what's right. Even if it's actually inconvenient. He swears to his own hurt and does not change. That's, that, that particular phrase really has stuck with me through the years. When you've agreed to do something... And then you come to, you know, time to do it, and you think, man, this is really gonna, this is really gonna hurt to do this. I, I shouldn't have agreed. Well, you did though. And if we are people of, that, you know, if you're a man of your word, of course, not all of us are men. So if you're a woman of your word, 
or a man of your word. Um, and it comes time to do it, don't back out because it's not convenient. That's not integrity. It's not integrity. In some of these psalms, the author describes his own, his own righteous character, like uh, Psalm 101. Let's turn, please, to the 101st Psalm. We're going to read this short psalm. Psalm 101, I will sing of loving kindness and justice. To you, O Lord, I will sing praises. I will give heed to the blameless way. When will you come to me? I will walk within my heart, I mean within my house, in the integrity of my heart. I will set no worthless thing before my eyes. I hate the work of those who fall away. It shall not fasten its grip on me. A perverse heart shall depart from me. I will know no evil. Whoever secretly slanders his neighbor, him I will destroy. No one who has a haughty look and an arrogant heart will I endure. My eyes shall be upon the faithful of the land, that they may dwell with me. He who walks in a blameless way is the one who will minister to me. He who practices deceit shall not dwell within my house. He who speaks falsehood shall not maintain his position before me. Every morning I will destroy all the wicked of the land so as to cut off from the city of the Lord all those who do iniquity. Of course, we realize this is David and he was king. But a lot of this really has powerful application to us. He, he talks about what he does in his house. There's one thing what we do out there. There's another thing what we do in our house. And he's saying, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be a person who lives with integrity even with my, within my own house when maybe nobody is even uh, watching me. Of course, we know David didn't always keep to that commitment. But that's a good commitment to make. He also places this heavy emphasis about surrounding himself with godly people, not wicked people. That, that is a really major emphasis in, in many of the Psalms. Who we surround ourselves with. It's so very, very important. Paul spoke of that in 1 Corinthians 15 as well. Uh, in verse 3 is my favorite of this psalm. Verse 3 at the beginning of that verse, I will set no worthless thing before my eyes. He's probably talking about idols. But I think that there is a wide range of application to that. I, when I preached in uh, Dade City, I preached at the Trilacucci Church. And... Um, there was also the Dade City Church of Christ, both of those two churches in the same town. And so a buddy of mine preached at the Dade City Church. His name is Adam Shanks. And he had us over to his house one time. He has young kids. And on, on his television, below the screen, he had that part of Psalm 101 printed out and taped under the screen. I will set no worthless thing before my eyes. And that made a big impact on me. And I, I think that that's just a, a verse we need to keep in our minds, in, in our culture, with a lot of the things that you could lay your eyes on uh, that are on your computer screen and so forth that we have to commit. Uh, as Job said in Job 31 and verse 1, I've made a covenant with my eyes. Not only does David in this psalm express that he is righteous, but he is also expressing the intent to have the character of the righteous, his plan to do that moving forward, what he will do. We don't become righteous by accident. It's something we have to plan to do. You've probably heard me say a thousand times what Zig Ziglar said, that if you aim for nothing, you'll hit it every time. And so we've got to aim for righteousness. If we're just kind of floating through the, the, the Christian life, expecting to get somewhere, we're not going to get anywhere more than just coming and filling a pew. It's, it's about uh, growing and becoming better. And to make that commitment, what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm going to make sure that I serve the Lord. I'm not going to set any worthless thing before my eyes. I'm not going to surround myself with wicked people. That's my commitment. That's my goal. And if you shoot for that, you'll be much more likely to hit that. Some of these psalms describe the benefits of committing one's life to the Lord. Uh, such as Psalm 91. Why don't we turn to that beautiful psalm? Psalm 91, verse 1. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but we'll look at a few verses. Verse 1, He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. So this idea that 
God will protect you. You're under His shadow. He, he is your shelter. Look at verse 5. You will not be afraid of the terror by night or the arrow that flies by day or the pestilence that stalks in darkness or of the destruction that lays waste at noon. Look at verse 10. No evil will befall you, nor will any plague come near your tent. For He will give His angels charge concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will bear you up in their hands that you do not strike your foot against the stone. Those last two verses sound kind of familiar? Jesus. Jesus. Okay. Actually, Jesus wasn't the one who quoted this, though. Who was it? It was Satan when Jesus was tempted in the wilderness. That's right. That's right. So Matthew 4, 5, verses 5 and 6, then the devil, this is the second temptation here, then the devil took him into the holy city and had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple, uh, which wasn't like the temple structure itself, but the, 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 temple, um, the temple area had kind of an edge, okay? And it was, a, it was pretty, on um, one of the particular corners, it was a pretty steep fall. And that's probably what this is talking about. And said to him, if you're the son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Satan knew this passage from Psalm 91. Imagine he... this quote. Right. And tell me how he misapplied it. How did he misapply it? Okay, that's right. But specifically, how did he misapply this psalm when he when he was trying to apply that particularly to Jesus about jumping down from the from the temple? He's talking about the psalm is actually talking about if something should happen to Christ, not if Christ intentionally did something to try to test God. Okay. Okay. That's a possibility. Let me let me suggest that this psalm isn't even messianic. Jesus was a servant of God, but this isn't a particularly uh, a specifically messianic psalm. I think it's speaking of any servant of God. If we trust in God, God will protect us. We don't have anything to fear. So first of all, he tried to make a messianic psalm out of a psalm that's not messianic. Secondly, he was trying to literalize poetic language. <clears throat> Was this psalm saying, listen, if you're a servant of God and there's a stone right there and you're about to hit your foot, don't worry because an angel will pick you up and you won't ever hit your foot on any rocks. That's ridiculous. That's just as ridiculous as saying, well, what it means is if you jump from a high place, you won't hit your foot on a stone because the angels will catch you. It's saying in a poetic way, and that's the thing we have to realize about this kind of literature is it is poetic in nature, and it's, it's saying, look, God is going to protect you. But how much more beautiful of a way to say that, uh, the way that the psalmist says it, that he will give his angels charge concerning you to guard you in all your ways that will bear you up in their hands so that you do not strike your foot against a stone. That sounds so much more vivid and powerful than just saying, God will protect you. right? And that's the thing we have to realize about the wisdom literature is it is written in a way that makes the ideas come to life with oftentimes in, in ways that are not literally described, but, uh, but figurative. And when you're talking about the imagery, it's that full power of God to protect you even in the smallest of ways. Good. Very good. So I just wanted to, I know we went a little deeper there, but I wanted to point that out because that, that's a, a well-known passage from Psalm 91. Let's look now at three psalms that contrast the character and or the destiny of the righteous and the wicked. Psalm 1 is obviously the most well-known of these. So let's turn to Psalm 1. This is a preface really for the entire book of Psalms. I'm going to read this psalm. How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither, and in whatever he does, he prospers. 
The wicked are not so, but they are like chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. So what a beautiful psalm. I love verse 1 and the progression there that the righteous person, he doesn't walk, stand, or even sit with the wicked. Again, we have to be careful who we choose to surround ourselves with. Sometimes you have no control about that, but, but oftentimes you have more control than you may realize. And his delight is in the law of the Lord. He, he meditates. He, he, he just ponders these thoughts and rehearses them in his mind. He just chews on them, just over and over. And that's such a powerful concept throughout uh, many of the Psalms, is this idea of meditating. We don't talk about it. We talk about reading God's Word and studying God's Word and praying. But rarely do we talk about meditation. And uh, I, I just can't, I can't encourage you enough to, to do that. As for these other two Psalms, Psalm 37 and 73, they are related. Uh, and it's easy to remember that because, you know, 37 is 73 backwards. So these two Psalms both have something in common. In these Psalms, David struggles with the success of the wicked. And, you know, why is it that the wicked prosper? He really struggles with that, but he concludes that the resolution to the problem is the terrible end of the wicked and uh, the glorious reward of the righteous. We need to keep that in mind as well if we ever struggle with, well, it doesn't look like it's any benefit to be serving God, that in the end it will be uh, a tremendous benefit for serving God. Two more psalms, and then I'll open up for comments. Uh, the unreliability of this world for security. Psalm 49 and Psalm 90. So nothing else really matters besides serving God. We can't trust in anything in this world for security. And one of the first things that comes to your mind when you think of what, what do people so often trust in for security? Is what? Money. Their bank account, their 401k. And so Psalm 49 describes the folly of trusting in riches. And, you know, in verse 17, he says, For when he that is the wicked died, he will carry nothing away. His glory will not descend after him. Who, who does that, what, what does that kind of remind you of something that somebody said that we kind of studied recently? Job. Job. After the first round of his suffering, what did Job say? Right. Naked I came into this world, naked I will depart. Um, you know, covetousness is a really serious sin in America and a major temptation that we may not like to admit that we struggle with. I want to admit something to you. I really have a struggle because I love Tesla cars. <laughs> Any of y'all keep up with that? I read on the, my boys and I, we go to, we go to that website and we, I mean, it's just like, we're just dreaming of the day we can, and when we see one on the road, you know, it's just like, Ooh, it's a Tesla, it's a model three, it's a model S and whatever. And you know, my boys will just lose their minds. It's just, I just want to touch it. And I, I just had to, I just had to say the other day, now listen, guys, uh, lust of the eyes is one of the three categories and we need to be careful that we're not filled with covetousness about these Tesla cars. It's a really nice car. I'd like to have one one day, but at the end of the day, it's a car. It's got four wheels, gets you from point A to point B, and I'm not gonna be driving a Tesla around up in heaven. I'm not gonna be able to take it with me if I ever did get one when I die. And we're not gonna be able to take any of these things on this planet with us when we die. So you can just see the value of the wisdom literature in bringing so many of these truths out, reminding us of things that we know deep down. Psalm 90 contrasts the eternal nature of God with the brevity of man. We, we just have to read from this one. So if you will, please turn to Psalm 90. So hard to cherry pick which psalms that I, I want to point out, but I tried to pick out some of the most weighty psalms. In the... The heading, which is not inspired, but is probably accurate, who wrote this particular psalm? That's right. It says, A prayer of Moses, the man of God. 
So that's interesting. Moses wrote uh, this particular uh, psalm. In verses 1 and 2, Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were born, or you gave birth to the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting. You are God. What does that mean, from everlasting to everlasting? Okay, so if you look back, you know, eternity was long before the world ever was created. So from everlasting to everlasting, the future is just going to go on forever. That's our God. That's our God. And look at verse 4. For a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it passes by or as a watch in the night. I just have to believe that Peter had that passage in mind in 2 Peter 3 and verse 8. Remember what Peter said? A thousand years are as one day to God. And one day as a thousand years. Uh, there is no. Look at verse 10. As for the days of our life, they contain 70 years. Or if due to strength, 80 years. Yet their pride is but labor and sorrow. For soon it is gone and we fly away. Verse 10. So teach us to number our days that we may present to you a heart of wisdom. It wasn't anything novel. I don't really even have to comment on any of that. It just is a great reminder that God is eternal and we are very much not. And we need to keep that in mind and keep our priorities straight and not think that we are eternal. Any thoughts or comments before we go into the next uh, category? Jason? I don't think you can underemphasize something you mentioned earlier that righteousness is a choice. Now, there are characteristics about you and I that uh, are, are not a choice. Our skin color, uh, our eye color, uh, the amount of hair you and I don't have. Um, uh, yeah. But, but the, the, and you go into to Peter where he talks about as your faith virtue, the virtue, knowledge, knowledge, difference, difference, faith, 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 God, 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 love. All of those characteristics, all of those are choices. There are things that you choose to be. Right. You choose to be patient with somebody. You work on being patient yeah. with somebody. And ultimately, all of those characteristics sum up to righteousness. Yep. But, but it, it's a choice, whether it, it means we choose to do the right thing. I always love the Mark Twain code, you're never wrong to do the right thing. You know, and that means regardless of the cost to you or the blowback on you or whatever, you're never wrong. But you choose that. You choose to meditate in God's Word. Yeah. You choose to pray. You choose to be kind. All those things are choices, and the sum of those choices will determine where we are on the scale of quote-unquote righteousness. But, but it, it, it can't be underemphasized that it, that it is a choice and a pursuit. Yeah. Um, Amen. Because we, we, we fail to do that sometimes. And, and I think the other thing is uh, that you mentioned that true virtue or true integrity is what we do when nobody's watching. Because yeah. first off, God is always watching. But, but secondly, <clears throat> that is the test of us. Sometimes we may conduct our in a certain way because, oh, we don't want anybody to see us doing anything wrong. Right. But the real question is, when we don't think anybody's seeing us, how do we conduct ourselves? Amen. And again, that's a choice. Yeah. And part of, that, part of that choice is realizing it's not going to be easy, but I'm still going to do it. And when you prepare your mind that way and you know, this is going to be hard. Uh, but I'm going to expect it to be hard. But I know what I'm, the choice I'm going to make when it gets hard. And when I'm between a rock and a hard place, I know what I'm going to do. <laughs> Bill likes it to talk about you make that decision ahead of time. Yep. So when the problem comes up, you've already decided. You've already made up your mind. You don't you don't have a choice to make in that in that moment. So that's great. Good. Brian? Yeah, it's neat because it, it's neat that in the covenant, like in Leviticus 26, we talked about Sunday, God just says, here's the blessings of obedience, here's the cursings of disobedience. And it's easy to maybe see that as some dry thing, like, well, if I... I obey God, I'll be blessed. If I disobey Him, I'll, you know, bad things will happen. But the Psalms, especially these, they contrast the righteous path with the wicked path. Mm -hmm. Gives that poetic expression to the beauty of the righteous path. It's not, right. it's not just that God is doing this, you know, randomly. It's that this actually is the most wonderful way to live that yeah. you know, brings the most spiritual fulfillment and blessing. Yeah. While the wicked path is full of misery and right. 
know, covetousness and you know, all the other maybe spiritual curses as yeah. well. Yeah. Yeah, and it's hard for me to, um, you know, bounce back after studying Job and, and arguing that Job's friends were wrong, and they were, that, you know, the, the righteous person is always blessed and the wicked person is, is always worse off. That's not always true. But, uh, but it is a general truth that there, there are tremendous blessings of serving God. And a lot of those blessings, you can't see them. They're, they're internal. And uh, the, the wicked person doesn't understand those. He doesn't have that hope. It's important. Spencer? Just, uh, I hope a short comment, but in, in, the, in one sense, pursuing righteousness is pursuing the image of God. Right. We're made in God's image. And as you said, we have free choice. We have free will to make this choice. Matter of fact, it's the most important and beautiful gift that we've been given from God because it's the only one for which we have absolute control. Mm -hmm. Choice is the only thing that we get to control. Yeah. We can't control the weather. We can't control how other people act. We can't do. Right. As a matter of fact, most of our life is out of control, but we yeah. get to control our thoughts. Yeah. And the pursuit of righteousness, as described here, is is like it says in First Peter chapter one: "Be holy, for I am holy." And I think some of us walk around thinking that holiness is not really that. It's possible. It's not possible. But it is because God said it was. He says, yeah. do it. It's there, right there. Be holy because I'm holy. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's what the Psalms, the study of the Psalms help us to do yeah. is to pursue the image of, of God. Absolutely. Great comments. Well, let's turn our attention. Thanks, everybody, for those comments. Very good. To talk about uh, the grief for, grief for sin. There are four particular psalms that really focus on grief over sin. Psalm 6, 38, 51, and 137. Now, 50, Psalm 51 is obviously the most well-known of these. What is that psalm in connection with? What, what had happened in David's life? David and Bathsheba. Yes, and, and also the murder of, her hus uh, of Bathsheba's husband, Uriah. And David was, once he realized his sin, uh, after Nathan the prophet pointed it, pointed it out, he was, he was, you know, just stricken with grief over what he had done. And we've already studied that psalm. So I'm not going to go back and look at that. But uh, Psalm 6 is another one that is a prayer for mercy. For example, David prays, uh, I am weary with my groaning. Every night I make my bed to swim in my tears. Again, the power of poetic language in this wisdom literature. So expressive. And a point, a great point that Brian made in his class, I listened to it, uh, obviously I wasn't here, uh, is the Psalms really get to our emotional side. It doesn't just emphasize the intellect. It gets deeper than that. Psalm 38 is like Psalm 51 in that it expresses intense grief and penitence for sin. Maybe on, maybe on par with Psalm 51 even, but look, look there in Psalm 38, a much less known psalm, lesser known. Let's look at a few of these verses. Psalm 38, verses 1 through 4. David here says, O Lord, rebuke me not in your wrath, and chasten me not in your burning anger. For your arrows have sunk deep into me, and your hand is pressed down on me. There is no soundness in my flesh because of your indignation. There is no health in my bones because of my sin, for my iniquities are gone over my head. As a heavy burden, they weigh too much for me. Look at verses 9 and 10. Lord, all my desire is before you, and my sighing is not hidden from you. My heart throbs, my strength fails me, and the light of my eyes, even that has gone from me. 17 and 18. For I am ready to fall, and my, sorrows, my sorrow is continually before me. For I confess my iniquity. I am full of anxiety because of my sin. And he goes on to talk about that his enemies still are threatening him and pressing against him. Verse 21, do not forsake me, O Lord. O my God, do not be far from me. Make haste to help me, O Lord, my salvation. So the context of this is he's under some kind of threat and maybe even some kind of physical malady. And he is, he's just feeling this weight of sin upon him so heavily. 
And we can relate so much to that, that feeling of, uh, of just this dread that we've done something terrible and we want to be right with God. And by the way, you go ahead. That, that's the way we should feel if we have unforgiven sin. If, if you've already repented of it and prayed for forgiveness and you're a Christian, you don't need to feel that way. You need to feel like, yeah, I did something bad and, and I do feel guilty that I did it, but I'm, I'm, I'm forgiving myself and I'm moving on. But if you've done wickedness and you haven't repented and that doesn't touch your heart, it doesn't bother you, is that problematic? It's definitely, it's definitely problematic. Phil, did you have a comment? Yeah. You, know, you read earlier that David walked in the integrity of, in the integrity of his heart. Uh, sometimes we get a, a wrong picture about David. He was as righteous as he claims to have been. He was also very much a sinner. Yeah. And as a Christian, we have to learn not only to pursue righteousness, but we need to learn how to handle sin. True. But God wants us to handle it in a righteous way. Yeah. David understood the grace of God. Right. He recognized that even though he would fall from time to time in sin, that the grace of God allowed him and empowered him to be able to get back up and pursue righteousness and pursue God. Amen. And not give up. And that's our struggle. Yeah. That's what we have to do as righteous people is recognize yeah. when we fall, it's not the end, it's an event. Yeah. We can turn from that and repent and come back to God and pursue him again. That's right. Over and over. And that's all what a Christian walk is all about. And the balance of both, you know, recognizing the enormity of our sin and having this deep grief and penitence over what we did and then being able to move forward. That's a hard combo. That's a hard combination. And David, David had that. He understood that. And that's the problem I see so many Christians have. They'll, they'll either, either have all this guilt and shame... Uh, or they'll really not have much of that at all. They'll be able to move on. We've we got to have, we have the guilt and shame, and we've got to, once we've repented of it, then be able to move on and forgive yourself and, and be what God wants you to be. Great point. Let's now turn logically to psalms that deal with the forgiveness of sin. I don't have much time. There are four particular psalms that really emphasize the forgiveness of sin, 25, 32, 85, and 130. In the 25th Psalm, David just repeatedly asks God for forgiveness, to, to forgive the sins of his youth. Or as he says in one place, for your name's sake, O Lord, pardon my iniquity because it is great. David never sugarcoated his sin. Sometimes we just want to rattle off, you know, Father, forgive me as I forgive those who sin against me. And we, we feel like we kind of did our duty and we don't really feel the pain of it. We don't realize, as I said earlier, the enormity of what we've done. We've, we've really hurt God. And we've, you know, incurred a 10,000 talent debt, as Jesus talked about in, in Matthew 18. And he just repeatedly asked for forgiveness. I just, you know, when you're really sorry you did something, you're not content with just a passing, well, I'm sorry. You know, my oldest son, Ty, when he, when he ever does anything wrong, that poor kid, he, he just apologizes and apologizes and apologizes. Sometimes it gets to the point where Holly and I are like, okay, we, we forgive you and, you know, you don't have to keep apologizing, you, you know, move on. But he needed to do that. He needs to do that because he just, he has such a tender heart. He just feels so bad. It, it's okay to do that with God. In fact, I, I would encourage you to think about putting a little bit more emphasis in your, in your prayers of repentance and asking for forgiveness to dwell a little bit more on what you did wrong and how sorry you really are and how much you really hurt God. Again, that's the, that is really the emotion that comes out in so many of these psalms. That it's not just checking it off, I ask God for forgiveness. He wants to know you really feel it. You really mean it from the bottom of, of your heart. Well, we don't have time to talk about Psalm 32. I really wish we could. We're, we're flat out of time. Appreciate everybody's uh, attention. Uh, please read through page 175 and the corresponding psalms uh, for Sunday. And I know Brian and I have been jumping around since I was on vacation, but he will be teaching again 
on Sunday. So be ready for that class. Thanks so much.